Okay, it's good to see everybody in again this afternoon, and um, my, we were just checking our, uh, our audience, and we got folks here today from Indiana and Colorado and Ohio and Minnesota. So, uh, any of you out there in TV land ever happen to come through Tulsa, be sure you check with us, and uh, maybe you can hit on a day when we're taping, usually the first Wednesday of, an, uh, of the month, but uh, not always. So, we like to have you call and make sure. So. Uh, we like to make you folks welcome here in the studio. For those of you joining us out in television, again, we always like to make it known we're just an informal, non-denominational Bible study. I don't adhere to any one group's line. Uh, I may step on the toes of others, and so be it. I'm going to stick with the book regardless. And again, we thank you for your prayers, your letters, your gifts, because without it, we couldn't do it. And so we just want you to understand that we appreciate every one of you. All right, now we're ready to start the next segment of the New Testament, which is 1 John. So if you're here in the studio, you should have already turned to 1 John, and this is going to be the beginning of book number 56 already. First four programs in book number 56. So those of you out in television, if you... Uh, write or call concerning one of these programs, just ask for book 56. All right, First John. Now, the first thing we've got to do is clarify some introduction, don't we? These little Jewish epistles, and I still say that's the best term you can put on them. James and Peter and John and Jude, and you might as well throw in Revelation as well, are all Jewish epistles. They are all addressed to Jewish believers. And never forget that. And uh, I'm going to go contrary to tradition as I am prone to do. And I do not feel that John wrote this in 90 some AD. I think these little epistles were all written about the same time that Paul was probably writing the church age epistles. And my number one reasoning for that is that there is not one word in these little Jewish epistles concerning the resurrection, not a word about the body of Christ, not a word about salvation by faith and faith alone. It is all still primarily, not exclusively, but it's primarily the kingdom message. And, and you'll see it as we come through here. It is so plain that they are not preaching Paul's gospel. Now, always remember, when I refer to Paul's gospel, I'm referring to what he said in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. That it's by my gospel, Paul says, that you are saved. And what is Paul's gospel? How that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and he arose again the third day, according to the scripture. That's Paul's gospel. And if you can't find that, then you have to recognize that they're not proclaiming Paul's gospel. They're in the kingdom economy. Now, the kingdom gospel starts out probably the plainest, when Jesus asked the twelve, back there in Matthew 19, 16, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And of course, some said, You're John the Baptist. Some think you're one of the prophets. But then he came back and he said, But whom do you say that I am? And Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Period. Well, of course, he couldn't mention the death, burial, and resurrection because it hadn't happened yet, and they didn't know it was going to happen. They had no idea that they would be going up to Jerusalem for a crucifixion. So the kingdom gospel is that Jesus was the Christ. He was the Son of God, and of course, he was offering Israel the glories of the earthly kingdom promised all the way up to the Old Testament. So as you come into these little epistles, and we've been stressing it ever since we started with the letter of James, that everything is directed as yet to Jewish kingdom believers. <laughs> they had simply believed that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. And uh, they're still under the law. And you're going to see language that indicates that, even in, even in John, 1 John. And so always be aware that there are things in here, of course, we can latch on to and we can make application, but by and large, all of these little Jewish epistles are written to Jewish kingdom believers who had probably been scattered out of the church at Jerusalem 
And uh, they're still under pressure of the Romans. They're also under the pressure of Orthodox Jews who were aghast that these people were ignorant enough to accept this Jesus of Nazareth as their Messiah. And so they're under tremendous persecution. And so the whole theme of all these little epistles, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, is to prepare these Jewish kingdom believers for the tribulation that's right out in front of them. The pressures that are right out in front of them. And they would have to go through that tribulation pressure before their Messiah could come and set up the kingdom. So watch for those scenarios as we come through these epistles. Not a word about the body of Christ. Not a word about the resurrection. Now there is some indication of his shed blood. I won't deny that. But there is nothing pertaining to the death, burial, and resurrection as the means of salvation. The means of salvation was to believe who Jesus really was. And I think you'll see it, and if you understand it from that direction, as we begin now in chapter 1, verse 1 of 1 John. Verse 1, that which was from the beginning. Now this is the same John that wrote the Gospel of John, and if you know your Bible, you shouldn't even have to go back and look. What does John 1, 1 say? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All right, now that's the same kind of thinking that John is still practicing here, see? That which was from the beginning, in other words, from eternity past, out of eternity past, the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit <coughs> brought about creation, see? And the only difference is that God the Son was the one who was assigned the role of calling it into being. They were all three there, they were all three part of it, but God the Son, whom John calls the Word, was the one who spoke and creation happened. God the Son spoke and out of the dust came Adam. God the Son spoke and all of these things happened in order to make everything ready for the ongoing of the human experience. All right, so John is taking us right back to the first thought he had in his gospel, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. Well, now stop and think. Who is this John? He's one of the twelve. He spent three years with him, see? And so he heard Jesus speaking in the flesh. And he says, which we have seen with our eyes. Well, of course they did. They were with him for three years, see? And which we have looked upon, and our own hands have handled. Now, let's go look up a verse of Scripture. Go back to Luke 24, honey. Luke 24. <laughs> Luke 24, verse 39. I was looking at 19, but it isn't. It's 39. Luke 24, but let's start at verse 36, so we pick up the flow, as I so often put it. Luke 24, and begin at verse 36. And of course now this is after His resurrection, and Jesus is appearing to them. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. And he said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted. Well, now you always got to stop and think. Were these men just as human as we are? Well, of course. Even though they had spent three years with Jesus and his earthly ministry, they were just as ordinary as you and I. How would you feel if all of a sudden someone that you had seen on a Roman cross a matter of hours before is all of a sudden standing in front? They didn't know anything of the resurrection. They couldn't comprehend that this was the risen Christ standing in front of them and it just scared them. See? And so Jesus sensed it and he says, don't 
be troubled in verse 38, see? And why do thoughts, that is fearsome, thoughts arise in your hearts? And now he shows them. Behold, my hands and my feet. He's standing in front of them in that physical body with which he was, well, yes, crucified and then laid in the tomb, now resurrected, of course, and into the resurrection power. But nevertheless, he still shows them his hands and his feet. See? Touch me and see, for spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. See how, how sensible this is? And this is after his resurrection. All right? Verse 40. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. He showed them the wounds. And while they yet believed not, in their joy, they wondered. And now, in order to prove it a little more, he says, do you have any food? Verse 42. Now, see, most people are completely ignorant of this. Or they've got such a foggy notion of it, they really don't know what to believe. But here is Christ in that resurrected body, standing before them as any other normal being, and yet he's in that resurrected body that in a split second can go from there to who knows how far away. But now he's going to prove a point not only is he the one that was crucified, not only is he the one that was in the tomb, he's the one that's resurrected, but he's going to give us a little inkling of our eternal state. What have we got to look forward to? All right, next verse. 42, so they gave him a piece of broiled fish and honeycomb. And he took it, and what did he do with it? He ate it. Not a lot of people don't understand that. Jesus in his resurrected body ate? Yes, of course he did. Right in front of them to prove the point. He ate, see? All right, now I've got to stop there a minute. Honey, go to Philippians. Go to Philippians. Because, see, you've got to compare Scripture with Scripture in order to put this whole scenario into an understandable state. Philippians, that's uh, Ephesians, Philippians, and then Colossians. So if you can find one of those, Philippians is right in the middle of it. Philippians, it's got to be in chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Philippians, chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now remember... When Jesus ascended back into glory, it was in that body that's standing in front of the men there. And I think there's only ten of them, not all twelve. But he's standing in front of those disciples, eating. And it's that same Christ that will ascend from the Mount of Olives in a matter of 40 days. All right? And it'll be that same Jesus Christ that's going to return for us one day and give us an inkling of our future state. We're not going to be floating around up there in some invisible ethereal state. We're going to have bodies. All right, here it is. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven. If you're a believer here today, your citizenship is already registered in the glories. And from whence, that is from heaven, we also look for the Savior. Now remember, this is Paul writing, and so Paul's going to use Pauline language. And so we're looking for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 21. Who? The Lord Jesus Christ, the one who's standing back there in our verse in Luke, eating meat and fish. All right? who shall change our vile body, this body that's prone to death and corruption, who shall change our vile body. Now look at this. This is enough to make you hit the ceiling, isn't it? That 
this old vile body may be fashioned or made like unto his glorious body. Now what does that mean? What it says? That one day our eternal body is going to be fashioned after this resurrected body in which Christ is now appearing to the disciples after his resurrection, after his death. See? All right, read it again. Who shall change, verse 21, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he, Christ, is able even to subdue all things unto himself. What does that mean? Every believer is going to be suddenly changed and made into a body like to his eternal body for all eternity. Now what we're going to be doing, the Bible doesn't really tell us, but it tells us this much. This is the kind of a body we're going to have. And yes, we're going to eat. You don't have to worry about pounds. <laughs> and you won't have to worry about polluted. And you won't have to worry about tainted or anything like that. But we're going to be capable of eating, see? All right. Now let's come back to John. I hope I made my point. That when John says, we've heard him, we've seen him, we've handled him. See, even the post-resurrection Christ, they had seen the nail prints in his hands. All right, reading back again in John chapter 1, that is 1 John now. Chapter 1, verse 1, the one that we have looked upon. Our hands have handled, in other words, he was for real. But who was he? The Word, capital I, the same Word that you see in John's Gospel, verse 1. In the beginning was the what? The Word. And when we teach John 1, what do we always associate with words? Communication. And so when it was time to create, God the Son, the Word of God, spoke, and He communicated with that which was seemingly nothing, and out of it came everything. Out of it came everything. And that's how He's always done it, see? And that's why we make so much of the Word, God the Son, as the great communicator. All right, now let's move on to verse 2. Back in 1 John. Chapter 1, verse 2. For the life, that is, that life of the Messiah, the Christ. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it. And bear witness and show unto you that eternal life. Now, you know, I try to be so careful, and yet once in a while, fortunately not very often, but once in a while will someone totally totally hear me wrong. And they'll write and say, well, you said. <laughs> no, I didn't say. They said, you said that Jesus never existed until he became the only begotten. That was when just a few programs back. I never said such a thing. And so I had to write back real quick and I said, man, of all the thousands of people we know are listening now, you're the only one who heard me wrong. And you heard me wrong. And they were trying to put it that I had said that Jesus Christ, or the Son, never existed until His resurrection. No, the point I was making, that the term, the terminology, the only begotten Son of God, applied to His resurrection. But see, they can just, they can get it so fouled up. And that's why I try to be so careful. All right, so here again, the life that was manifested or brought into the spotlight is speaking of those three years of earthly ministry. Because remember, this is written to Jews. John was one of the twelve. He was one who had spent three years with the Lord up and down the highways and byways of ancient Israel, see? All right, and that life we've seen and we bear witness of it and we show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father. See, all three persons of the Godhead are from eternity past. All three. 
not just one or not just two. They've all been part and parcel of the God from eternity past. And that life was manifested, he says, unto us. How? Through his earthly ministry. When he came in the flesh at Bethlehem, grew up in Nazareth, and then began his three years of earthly ministry to prove to the nation of Israel that he was that promised Messiah. All right, now verse 3. That which we have seen and heard. Now again, John is referring to Christ's earthly ministry. And that's what makes me think again that he had to write this in the early part of the scriptures, like in maybe the 50s, instead of way out there, almost at 100 A.D. It just doesn't make sense. But here he is. He's writing at the same time that the rest of the New Testament being written. And so the earthly ministry wasn't all that long ago. 15, 20 years at the very most, see? All right, so he says, That which we have seen and heard, we declare unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son. Now remember when we taught Hebrews, how I emphasized the Sonship of Christ, and how that that was his title, and that he was a part of the Godhead. All right. And with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, John says, these things we write unto you that your joy may be full. Now, I'm going to have to go back. It's running through my mind constantly. So that's usually, an, I think, a prodding of the Spirit. Come back with me to Matthew 16. I've already quoted portion of it. Matthew 16. Because the vast majority of church people in Christendom still do not understand the difference between the gospel of the kingdom which Jesus and the twelve preached to Israel and the gospel of the grace of God which is preached to us Gentiles. Two totally different scenarios under the same headship of the same God. All right, but here in Matthew 16, this is primarily the, the very heart of the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 16, we're going to start at verse 13 again, honey. Matthew 16, verse 13. Now, again the scenario. It's at the end of the three years. And they're about ready to go up to Jerusalem for the crucifixion. Three years, Jesus has been performing signs and wonders and miracles. What percentage of Israel has responded? Not a definite number, but approximate. Very few. Just a small percentage have responded to all of his signs and wonders and miracles. Now then, he comes to the heart of the matter as he approaches the twelve up there in northern Israel, and just a matter of hours before Passover and his crucifixion. All right, now remember, this is to the nation of Israel. And Israel was under the law. The temple is still going full speed. Animals sacrificed every day. Every good Jew is still going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. Every good Jew is still keeping the feast days. Every good Jew is still eating kosher. Every good Jew is keeping the Sabbath. Every good Jew is keeping the commandments. See? All right. Now then he approaches the twelve. After three years of miracles and signs and wonders to prove who he was. Verse 13. So when Jesus came to the borders of Caesarea Philippi, clear up there in northern Israel, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? Now why did he ask that particular question? Because this is what he'd been proving. This was the whole purpose of his signs and miracles, was to prove that he was that promised Messiah. Now we've been studying Isaiah in our Talakar class. And you come into Isaiah chapter 4, and here we come to a term of Christ that uh, is unique. He's called the branch. The branch. Out of the stem of Jesse. And he's referred to as the branch 
more often than not in the Old Testament. But every time he's referred to as the branch, he is referred to as another aspect of the four views of Christ in the four Gospels. They all fit. One of the branches is that he's to be the king. That's Matthew. One of the branches is that he's to be the servant. That's Mark. Another one of the branches depicts him as the man. That's Luke. Another one of the branches depicts him as God, deity. That's John. And so all through Scripture you have, especially the Old Testament, all the things that are pointing to this coming Messiah who would be the King of Israel. And that's why when he came and John the Baptist announced him, what did John the Baptist go out and preach? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, was he just spitting out empty words? Of course not. The king was about to appear, and the kingdom was within the grasp of the nation of Israel. And that's why we call it then the gospel of the kingdom. All right, now I've got to hurry. My goodness, those half hours we ought to stop the clock once in a while, shouldn't we? Okay, Matthew 16. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now verse 14. And they, the twelve, they answered and said, Well, some think you're John the Baptist, some think you're Elijah, some think you're Jeremiah, some think you're one of the other prophets. And he stops and he says, Okay, but whom do you say that I am? Have you learned anything in three years? And Peter answered. And here's his answer. Thou art the Christ, the anointed, the Messiah, the Son of the living God who's going to die for our sins and be buried and raised from the dead. No, he doesn't know that. And God doesn't expect him to. Peter simply gives us the heart of the gospel of the kingdom, that Jesus was the Christ. And that's what Israel was to believe. And they couldn't. They couldn't swallow it. See? All right, now I haven't got time to go any further, but we'll pick it up in our next program. But here in, in Matthew now then, when Peter says, Thou art the Christ of the living God, how does Jesus answer? Peter, what's the matter with you? No. He says, Peter, blessed art thou. See? And that's what we have to understand. The gospel of the kingdom. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding.